Hello. You've heard me tell the development history of the old world's greatest port city. But what if you were to actually visit that most interesting of places in the Warhammer world? This is not a history video. It's part lore, part travel journal. It's a travelogue. I'm Jordan. This is Jordan Sorcery. Welcome to Marienburg. Beneath your feet, the boards creak and groan as if they may break apart at any moment. It has been a long, tumultuous journey across the Sea of Claws, but the irony of your transport giving way as you arrive at port would seem fitting for such a journey, fraught as it has been with challenges, travails, and tall tales. But these are as no matter now, for ahead lies the great, irrepressible, rich, and reeking port city of Marienburg. Some say it is a place of boundless opportunity, whilst others say it is a place full only of mountebanks, conmen, and worse, businessmen. But something that everyone can agree upon is that with the vast number of bridges, upper floor windows, and panicky seagulls, when in Marienburg, always make sure to wear a hat. Like any ship entering this efficient and well-managed port, you have been boarded by a pilot who will guide the vessel into its berth on the sewer dock a mile-long stretch of docklands, wharfs, and endless warehouses. Under the guidance of the great lighthouse of Manon, it is slow going through these deceptively shallow waters. It is hard to conceive of the journey that many must have taken to be here, circumnavigating the globe to be one amongst a thousand thousand ships, summoned by commerce and surrounded by the vessels and ensigns of every civilized nation in the known world. The longboats of Norsican pelt traders vie for position with the elegant, silent craft of the elves and the heavy, steaming ironclads of the dwarfs. Boats and barges hailing from Cathay, Araby, and Sartosa mingle with Empire great ships and Bretonian galleons, and all of them waiting to sell their goods in the trading halls of this great city. It is not surprising that a common claim of the Marienburger merchant is that if you can't buy it in Marienburg, it hasn't been invented yet. Even though it will still take time for your ship to reach its disembarkment, your fellow passengers have already begun assembling on deck. Eager are they all to make their way onto the next stage of their adventures in this city of promise. Amongst the party is the well-travelled old soak Banbury Bonferin, a halfling whose social peculiarities are matched only by his ability to make any one sentence last a lifetime. He claims to have traversed the length and breadth of the old world, travelling deep into forbidden dwarven cities, surviving capture by hideous beastmen, dining with elven lords, and even carrying the bags of famed journaler Tobias Helmgart along the banks of the Reich. The truth of these claims is, of course, unverifiable, but the twin facts that Bunferin speaks at interminable length on any given subject, and that his accent seems to change with every other sentence, makes it very difficult to believe or indeed care about anything he has to say, whether it's true or not. After several days in the bunk across from him, you'll be glad to be back on dry land and far from earshot during his next lecture, no doubt on more of the forgotten secrets of the ancient lizard gods or the mind-numbingly detailed origin of the great Trudeau sparkling wines. As the boatswain makes ready your vessel for the end of its long journey, you realise with sudden and abject horror that upon seeing the immense scale of the harbour before you, you have reflexively, and without a forethought, asked Bunferin a question. Marienburg may be the greatest city in the old world. Don't let any imperial fool tell you it's Altdorf, or worse, Middenheim. Moore's teeth, what a terrible place that is. No, Marienburg is the centre of trade for the entire old world. Every nation, every people, every commodity finds its way into Marienburg, usually on its way to somewhere else. For some, being the centre of commerce would necessarily make it the centre of culture, and indeed, civilization. I don't know that I have trade with that claim, but I must admit this city is impressive, especially if you want to buy, sell, or otherwise acquire anything. Rare jewels and weapons are like common merchandise to the traders of Marienburg. 
and it takes a very special order to test the limits of their supply chain. Cursed Lustrian gold, Nehekaran urns, fragments of Sigmar's own comet, even armor of nefarious celestial persuasion. All of it, and more, changes hands in this place for twice the profit and half the mess you might expect. But it has not always been such a beacon to the commercially inclined, the capitalist or the cut purse. I've heard stories that the wasteland, all this swamp and marsh and muck that it is, didn't used to be that way at all. When the elves first settled here, when they built their great fortress, the fortress of the star gem on the sandy coast, this land was fertile, verdant and clean. Back then, the dwarves and the elves were friendly peoples. Before they began centuries of war, they lived peacefully side by side. The sea elves grew their great fortress, expanding and extending it, making it into a palace of unparalleled beauty, whilst the dwarves, ever the more practical race, built a mighty embankment to protect the settlements. The many islands at the mouth of the River Reich were captured and built on. Houses, workplaces, great banqueting halls and noble bastions were all constructed and peopled by elf and dwarf alike. But then, as with all things, an end came. These two ancient, bitter races made war with one another, and the fortress, the island homes, the bridges that straddled the crystal clear waters, they were all torn down, dismantled and destroyed. The dwarves drove the elves off, the elves drove the dwarves off, and in the end, the entire place was abandoned by both. Abandoned to forces far more sinister. You probably wouldn't believe me if I said that there were rats that walked like men. You're even less likely to believe that such a creature could communicate and plan and build. But that's the story I've been told. And I have it on good authority that Two Eyes Dieter had actually seen such a rat man with his half good eye. Whatever the truth, beings not of the kind elf, dwarf, or man took over this land and they corrupted it. The dirt sank below the water, the water became putrid, and the marsh took hold. They say that another war overcame the entire place. One fought between foul manrat and the hideous one-eyed greenskins known as the Fimir. It was a conflict of cataclysmic proportions that blighted the land and destroyed equally the twain sides. Rather ish. I know not what took place during their war, nor how or why it was ended, but I do know for sure what happened next. The first men found the ruins of the old elf and dwarf settlements, abandoned once again. The dwarf and sea wall was about the only thing that had survived all that time, but the ruin-topped islands of the area held a great deal of promise. It has been claimed that the noble Marius, the so-called Fenwolf of the Jotons, was granted a vision of his people. He saw them prosperous, safe, and free all at the same time, something they could never be if they stayed in the Forest of Shadows and under the heel of the unstoppable tribe of Teutonans. This was long before Sigmar would unite the men of the Old World and found his empire. Back then, it was every tribe for themselves. Bringing only what they could carry, the Jotons were led by Marius through the dangers of the marshlands. It became clear that not every rattling or fimir had perished in their great war, but there were many more that did die at the end of the Fenwolf's blade. In a final battle for supremacy, Marius claimed the head of the Fimir Queen. The site of their single combat is known today as the Slagveltsrots, the battlefield rock. The Jotun tribe laid claim to all the lands between the forest and the sea, and Marius was crowned the king of Jotunsrik. In honour of himself, he founded this city of Marienburg, on the ruins of the old CL fortress, and built his own tower atop the Riker's Isle. Even today, the mighty fortress and prison sits on that same island island, unperturbed by the storms of sea, war, and politics that ever seek to overwhelm it. You'll want to avoid getting sentenced to any time in the directorate's prison on Riker's Isle. In there, even an innocent man can lose a decade quicker than a halfling finishes breakfast. Trust me. It is easy to forget that Marienburg sits in the midst of marshland. So civilized and built up is the city itself. But one can never forget that it rests against the cutting edge of the sea. Situated on the sea mouth of the great river Reich, Marienburg is not built on land. 
so much as it's built on many lands. A thousand islands or more have been turned into a cohesive city fit for people and trade through the construction of countless docks, jetties, bridges, pontoons, and a good deal more examples of innovative engineering. There is so much building here that even the bridges themselves are home to houses, taverns, and shops. The Great Hugbrug Bridge runs all the way from the Palace District to the High Tower Isle, crossing the Reich at such a height that even a full-masted ship can pass beneath it. Perhaps more impressive still is the Drehenbrug Swing Bridge. Do you know that it pivots on a central pillar to allow ships to pass underneath? Of course. The fools who built houses on the Drehenbrug soon found themselves sliding off the other end into the river below. The dafties. And then there's the elf town. That's where the sea elves settled upon their return to the city after many centuries. It was already a bustling man-made port by then, but in his magnanimity the Baron of Westerland and ruler of Marienburg chose to grant back to the sea elves their ancestral homes. And henceforth, in many ways, the city has been one of both man and elf. Our destination, the sewer dock, is where the teamsters, dock workers, and stevedores ply their trade. A near endless arrangement of warehouses and jetties. More warehouses, even, than you could hope to fill with a lifetime of cargo. This really is where Marienburg is at its most Marienburgian. Some will tell you it is the fops and the dandies. The fools with money to burn and something to prove. But for me, it's the sewer dock that speaks of Marienburg's character. That is where the work of Marienburg is done, and where the skills, tenacity, craftsmanship, and craftiness of its people is honed. From the sewer dock, cargo is loaded, unloaded, sold, bartered, traded, and transported throughout the city and beyond. And whether it is beginning, continuing, or ending its journey, you can be certain that at least one Marienburger has already taken their cut. The sewer dock may be the heart of Marienburg, pumping lifeblood through the rest of the city and indeed the old world. But it is only one part of the wondrous process these people have perfected. All this trade is made possible by the maddeningly complex work of the brokers at the Wasteland Import-Export Exchange. Now, I will confess to you that on occasion I have enjoyed the blood spilling in the fighting pits. But even I am given pause by the violence and visceral carnage that occurs every day at the change. Fortunes lost and won, dreams realized and hopes smashed. It may make the running of the city possible, but it has a chaotic air of Zinchian confusion to all but the most numerate of individuals. Even my old friend Paymaster Dietrich almost lost his mind after just five minutes visiting the trading floor. The change and its brokers handle the flow of money and produce within the city, acting on behalf of the wealthy merchant families of Marienburg. There are many such families. The de Rolifs specialize in luxuries from Tylea, Estalia, and Araby. Van Scheldt control the fishing industry. But the wealthiest of all, of course, are the Van der Kupers. They make their money in everything, from Avalander corn futures to Cathian medicinals. Their business interests are as broad as they are deep. At the head of the house is Jan van der Kuper. Surely you have heard of him. It is common knowledge that he is the richest man in the old world, possessing more gold than the dwarves of Kazarakarak, more ancient heirlooms than the elves of Ulthuan, and perhaps even more wealth than the Emperor Karl Franz himself. Together, the ten great houses compose the Directorate, a ruling body responsible for the governance of Marienburg. You see, though the city is the gateway for trade to the empire, it is not of the empire. In the 2400s, the leaders of Marienburg had had enough of imperial control. For a hundred years or more, there had been no baron of the Westerland. The line had died out without an heir. In his wisdom, Magnus the Pious granted control of the city and its surrounding lands to a council of influential burghers entrusted with responsibility for ruling on behalf of their emperor. Over time, the council took charge of taxes, defense, and every other meaningful act of governance, and eventually, when the empire was weak under the rule of Wilhelm III, 
they declared their independence. Of course, Wilhelm thought he could prevent the secession, mocking the Westerland as a mere wasteland, and even marching an army into the so-called wastes to retake the city. But it seems he forgot that Marienburg was by then the richest city in all of the empire, and as a result, it had the best mercenary army money could buy. Wilhelm's efforts were repelled and the city council, and later the directorate that replaced it, was secure in its control of Marienburg. So confident and proud were they, that they even reclaimed the mocking title of the wasteland and made it their own. So, the sewer dock may be the heart of Marienburg, and the directorate its head. What of Marienburg's soul? This is not the domain of Sigmar, nor Ulrich, like those damnable beasts in Middenheim would have you worship. No, the people of this city, nestled as it is in the very sharp-toothed mouth of the Sea of Claws, have a long history of respecting, praising, and no doubt occasionally cursing, Manon, the lord of the sea. It is a fickle god that might one moment feed a nation with plentiful fish, and the next drown half of this city beneath spring floods of unknown fury. But Manan is fickle indeed. Suffice to say, that should you ever dream of drowning, you have earned his displeasure, and when you awake, you should place a fresh trout on your head, turn around, and spit five times if you are to win back his good grace. In Marienburg, it is the cult of Manan that directs the practice of his worship. As a result of their benedictions and administrations, do many ships safely survive the worst storms of the claws. If you are wishing to seek guidance from man and servants, or even if you merely wish to be astonished at what the industrious of a people can achieve, then you would do well to visit the Cathedral of Manon. It is known to many as the Crown Jewel of Marienburg, an impressive construction that is, in places, more than 2,000 years old. After his victory over the Fimir, Marius even laid the first stone in the cathedral's foundations. The three magnificent bell towers stretch skyward as if they were the prongs of Manon's trident itself. Inside, you will find everything is of a scale befitting the holiest site in the richest city in the old world. But none can prepare themselves for what stands in place of an altar in the apse of the cathedral. An enormous plate of perfectly transparent glass holds behind it a vast aquarium. Hundreds of thousands of gallons of salt water play host to a living tribute to the seas and the life of Manon's kingdom. I was once told over dinner by a high lawmaster of, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say, but I was reliably informed that the aquarium's glass was a gift from the phoenix king of the high elves himself, and that even the greatest mages of the Altdorf colleges cannot replicate the effect of its magic. And there is more magic to be found in that great cathedral if you only look up. They say that at the very top of its towers there stands a set of statues dating from a time before the Wizards' War, when demonologists in the Empire had yet to be cast out. The statues are said to be demons or some such, summoned in past defence of the city in its most desperate hour. No doubt, an old fisherman's tale. But I keep my eyes open anyway. I do hope that you've inquired ahead for your lodging in the city. You'll find there are a fair few disreputable hostelries and inns scattered around. I myself prefer the simple, clean boarding offered at Coaster's house, and I am pious enough to tolerate the landlady's religious remonstrations. But I wonder if you might be more of a mind to stay at somewhere like the Pelican's Perch. The tales they tell of the place are harmless enough. A modest hostelry frequented by the very salt of Marienburg. I wouldn't be surprised to find our good pilot and this ship's crew in there by sundown. The proprietor, old Ishmael Bosvelt, is as superstitious as they come. He says that surnames are the sign of a dead man, insists 
that everyone just call him Ishmael. I can't say I'm surprised with a name like Borsvelt. If he were a Bunferry man, he'd insist on the opposite, I'm sure. In any case, Ishmael makes the drinks, and Beaky makes conversation with the patrons. Beaky is the pelican, of course. Ah, it looks like our man has finally gotten the go-ahead to bring us into port. Our long journey is nearly at an end, my friend. Well, at least we had a good conversation to make the time fly, eh? Oh, forgive me. I didn't even answer your question yet. Yes, I have been to Marienburg before. I hope that you enjoyed visiting the great city of Marienburg. I loved showing you around. If you did, please feel free to leave a like, and why not leave a comment with the city or place in the Warhammer world that you would most like to see get the travelogue treatment next. And if you want to support the channel even more and you've got the means and inclination, you can check out my Patreon via the link in the description below. You will get the chance to vote on future priority topics, exclusive updates, as well as an invitation to join me for a live book chat as part of Jordan Sorcery's GW Books Club. We're going to be reading each of the original 17 GW books, starting with Ignorant Armies, and there is still time to join before our first meeting on August 20th. Thank you very much for watching. I am Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. Well, we made it. Not a single gargoyle. Which is good, because then I would have had to say gargoyle more than once. And it's a tremendous effort.